Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the first of the uh, Grand Round series for this academic year. Um, I want to um, thank our new Grand Rounds committee, um, Barbara uh, Stewart at San Francisco General co-chairs this with me, and our committee members this year, Nicole Bush, Caitlin Costello, Lauren Heck, uh, Eva Illy, Sean Lee, Jennifer Lai, Mina Park, Jacqueline Penn, and Marina Tulishams. Want to thank them for uh, all their heroic efforts uh, this summer to put this program together. This is the first year that we have filled all the 24 slots before we open. So uh, if anybody has trouble scheduling their time, they'll have to trade with other people. Uh, a couple of presenters have already talked to me about trading times, but uh, we really look forward to uh, this program, this academic year. Uh, we have a very special guest to open our program this year, Emily Tijani. She um, went to um, UC Santa Cruz undergraduate, UC San Diego Medical School, spent uh, six years at Yale for psychiatry and child psychiatry. So. Um, we, we feel very close to the Yale program. Um, Donald Cohen and, uh, who, and um, uh, Al Salnut, who had been the chiefs there, had a lot of influence on the development of our program, particularly when Irving Phillips was our chair. Um, Emily also has a board certification in addiction, uh, and she is a consultant to the SAMHSA Opioid Response Network, uh, and in as a consultant to the UCSF uh, new program on addiction in our outpatient clinic. Um, she is also newly appointed to our clinical faculty as her designation demonstrates, so we really welcome Emily to begin her work with us. Hi, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here and eager to have the chance to speak to all of you today about something that I'm really passionate about and that I do um, all of the time in my own practice, which is to work with adolescents and young adults who use marijuana and are experiencing uh, problematic issues uh, with their emotions, their behavior, or their functioning, and to try to understand and to help the patients and often their families better understand the ways in which marijuana is affecting them and is contributing to the difficulties that they're coming in with and from there to try to find a way to um, motivate these patients to want to change and feel capable of changing and actually change and uh, go on ultimately to feel better. And while I'm an addiction specialist and um, most patients who call me or usually it's the parents who call me are coming in with concerns related to marijuana use, I'm pretty sure that all of you here today, even if you don't specialize in addiction, if you work with youth, you probably see patients quite a bit in your own practices who are using marijuana and who are using it in a way that is uh, contributing to whatever the psychiatric reason is that they are coming in to see you. So the tricky thing I think for all of you who don't get a chief complaint of marijuana use when you first walk into the room with the patient is to try to find a way to create an environment and an interaction that encourages open discussion about um, marijuana habits, experience with marijuana, 
and uh, ultimately gets patients to a place of being interested in reflecting more on the way in which their marijuana use habits are affecting their overall functioning and well-being and from there to um, keep the patient interested in treatment and engaged in a treatment that looks not just at their psychiatric symptoms but also their marijuana use and ultimately results in some changes and some improvements in overall well-being. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, wrong button already. All right. I have uh, no conflicts, no disclosures. These are the learning objectives for today. We're going to cover the information relevant to the first two pretty quickly. I want to focus the bulk of the presentation on hopefully getting you to a point at the end of the presentation today where you feel that you can go back to your own practices, whatever sort of um, focus you have and population of youth that you work with, and be able to feel that you can start to utilize a therapeutic approach that effectively engages young people who use marijuana who are coming to see you for a reason other than marijuana use or substance use and become able as clinicians to more effectively help these teens reflect on the effects of their marijuana use and change their use patterns and ultimately feel better. So I'll start with the obvious. There have been huge shifts in public opinion and policy regarding marijuana over the past decade or two. And while this isn't the first time that there have been big cultural uh, shifts in thinking about marijuana, it's really the first time that we have ever seen such widespread endorsement of the benefits or potential benefits of marijuana use and um, open and widespread uh, consumption of marijuana and um, nowadays you can go to Amazon or to a bookstore and find children's books like this one. It's just a plant, a children's story about um, the medical benefits of marijuana, or you've all probably seen the billboards along the freeway that suggest that everyone in California is using cannabis and that marijuana is an effective treatment for whatever ails you. The other really big shift in marijuana in recent years, really over just the last decade, is that there are now a much greater variety of products and um, methods of consumption than ever before. For a very long time, um, the vast majority of people who used marijuana used the plant, the bud or flower, as most young people call it today. Um, I think it used to be called bud. Um, but people would usually smoke it, either in the form of a joint, a pipe, a bong. And while there were variants of some of the other forms I'm going to talk about, there it was not easy to find those products and they weren't commonly used. Um, nowadays, as you probably heard, a lot of youth vape marijuana. Um, and that involves using a marijuana concentrate, a liquid concentrate, that um, one would put typically in a pen, like this black pen here, and you press a button, they're usually uh, electronically powered with batteries, or you plug them in, and you can vaporize the concentrate and inhale the vapor. Um, you can also vape um, a product called dabs or wax or shatter. You may have heard about that. Um, that can also be uh, used in a dab rig, which is this contraption here. And then, of course, there's the edible products. And youth are still um, smoking flour most commonly. That's the way that most young people use. But um, most young people also use uh, vape, vape uh, concentrates or dabs or use edibles. And most people use a variety of all of these formulations and modes of consumption. And the reason that these new products are um, significant to know about and to think about when working with young people who use marijuana and the reason it's important to ask your patients you know, how they use and what they use is that the uh, products that are being vaped most commonly, the oils or the concentrates or the dabs and edibles, they are much higher in THC and even more importantly, they have a much higher ratio of THC to CBD than the plant, um, sometimes 10 times as high um, as flower does. And that uh, results in different biological effects in the short run and probably in the long run as well. I want to just briefly mention why I'm talking about marijuana here and not some other substance um, or specifically not alcohol. A lot of times when 
talking to people about marijuana use and youth, people want to have a discussion about um, alcohol versus marijuana. And that's not the focus of our discussion today, but it's also in general not a very productive discussion. Clearly there are um, risks to using both substances and the relative magnitude and the types of risks involved vary. Um, and that's true for every drug out there. I do want to point out that alcohol is still the most commonly used substance um, in teenagers and it's still the most, um, the first most likely substance to for a young person to first use when they're initiating substance use. Marijuana is kind of catching up but not quite there yet. But it's um, important to point out that the primary reason that a young person would seek treatment for a substance use disorder is for a marijuana or cannabis use disorder, not for alcohol use disorder. So you can see on this pie graph, which shows the percentage of teenagers who are admitted to an outpatient or inpatient substance use treatment facility, and three quarters of them are coming in primarily for a marijuana use disorder. I'll go back and forth between saying marijuana use disorder and cannabis use disorder. The DSM uses cannabis use disorder, but sometimes it's easier to say marijuana use, and that's what patients will often um, say marijuana, not cannabis. This is really different than what we see with adults. In adults, the primary reason for admission is alcohol use disorder, followed by prescription drug use disorders, and marijuana use disorder is uh, generally the third most common reason. So. Clearly, young people are most likely to experience problems related to marijuana use, and marijuana and alcohol are much more commonly used by teens than any other drug. There's a lot of misrepresentation in the lay press about what's happening with trends in um, adolescent marijuana use. If you read uh, newspaper headlines, you may come away thinking that there really haven't been any changes in the frequency with which or the amount with what of um, marijuana that young people are using. And while it's true that over the last few years there hasn't been much change in adolescent uh, past month or past year marijuana use, and all of this data is from Monitoring the Future, which is an annual night of funded study that um, asks high school students across the country about um, use and ideas and uh, behaviors related to consumption of various drugs. When you look back over a much longer span of time, from the early 90s until last year, what you see is actually very different. You see that there's been a near doubling um, of past month marijuana use by high school students. And at the same time, what's interesting is you see that there's been really a dramatic decrease in past month use of alcohol. We see similar trends with um, binge shrinking and we also see a decline um, in past month use of any drug other than marijuana. And there's other data that looks at adolescent risk behaviors at large, and that data shows that overall adolescents are engaging in less risky behaviors than ever before um, since we started measuring these things. But the uh, the amount of decrease for specific risk behaviors varies, and that uh, variation seems to be influenced by effects that are specific to the time period, social, cultural influences, and that's what we think is happening with marijuana. What's more significant um, and concerning than the last graph is the fact that daily marijuana use has tripled um, in 8th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. So young people are using marijuana more regularly than ever before and are more likely to use marijuana every day than they are to use uh, cigarettes daily. And 14% of uh, seniors in high school report at least um, one 30-day period when they use marijuana every day. We see similar trends with transitional age youth, a tripling in the number of people reporting daily use since the early 90s, but we see a bigger increase um, instead of a flatlining in past month and past year use. And when we look at all adults in the U.S., everyone 12 years and older, we see even more of a increase over an even shorter period of time from 2002 to 2014 in past month marijuana use. And then if you look back from the 70s, you see a steeper slope. And this increase is happening um, in all parts of the country, not just the West Coast. Um, there are studies, uh, there was a recently published study that looked not just at past month use, but past year 
use disorder, so people who were meeting criteria for a cannabis use disorder, this was in adults, and that study found that there was a doubling of past year cannabis use disorder in adults between 2002 and 2012, and that directly paralleled um, increases in past year use of marijuana during that time period, um, suggesting what we've seen in other studies, which is that some percentage of people who use marijuana with some regularity will go on to develop a use disorder. That number is about 10 to 30 percent, depending on the population you look at. We, you know, it's hard to say exactly why we see these fluctuating trends. As you probably know, it's hard to make causal infer inferences from ecological uh, data. There's a lot of different factors at play. And while well, there's a lot of discussion about how the changes in laws have affected youth use, it's probably too early to draw any conclusions. And it's complicated to sort these things out because usually there are changes in public perception long before the law actually changes. And what this graph is showing is a couple things, um, but one thing that's interesting to think about is this idea of generational forgetting, which is a way of explaining the fact that levels of illicit drug use in a population tend to stay fairly steady over time. So for the most part, you have about the same percentage of people who engage in monthly or yearly or daily substance use, but the most commonly used substances vary quite a bit from generation to generation. And what we've seen with marijuana, also heroin and cocaine, other drugs too, is that um, uh, likelihood of use or frequency of use of these drugs tends to sort of peak, go down, and then peak again. And what people think is probably happening here, at least to some extent, is that um, as the younger generation um, grows up, they are aware of and more intimately acquainted with the risks of using whatever drug was most popular and the generation before them. And so when they begin experimenting with substances, um, as many, not all, but many young people will do at some point, they uh, shy away from using the drug that they perceive as having a lot of harm and they either use a new drug that's come on the scene or go back to using a substance that um, has not been popular in some time. And data from the Monitoring the Future study uh, does support this theory. Um, in that study, they ask about perceived harm of using marijuana. And what they have found is exactly what you see here, which is that there's a pretty direct inverse relationship between perceived harm of marijuana use and likelihood of marijuana use. One thing I want to point out here, which is important to think about, is that um, the relationship between perceived harm and likelihood of use probably just applies to people who are using for the first time or are just beginning to use with you know, some frequency. When it comes to people who are already using a lot and have a use disorder, it's unlikely that um, an approach that focuses just on the harms of marijuana or on the risks of using marijuana is going to be effective. And you've probably all had that experience of you know, talking until you're blue in the face about all the risks of using marijuana with someone who uses a lot. And um, you probably found that that doesn't really result in any changes in their patterns of use. And because of that, I'm actually not going to go into too much detail about the risks associated with youth marijuana use. We could have a whole presentation about that and could spend a lot of time debating the um, validity and limitations of the studies out there. But um, you know, all I think you really need to know if you want to be able to help young people um, change and reduce their um, marijuana use is that most experts agree there is biological plausibility of a causal relationship between adolescent cannabis use and negative psychiatric outcome. And I listed here the most um, replicated findings or most biologically plausible findings. There is certainly an increased risk of addiction with adolescent marijuana use, addiction to both cannabis, but also substance use disorders. Importantly, a, a much higher risk of later onset opioid use disorder for people who initiate cannabis during adolescence, 
and that data is from really, really well controlled discordant twin studies that were done in the Netherlands that controlled somewhat for pure deviant or um, the criminal aspects. And then you're also probably aware of some of the associations between marijuana use and negative psychiatric outcomes, particularly in regard to depression or psychotic disorders. And then there's a variety of different um, short and also likely long-term cognitive um, risks of heavy adolescent marijuana use. Um, what I do think is probably more likely to be helpful to know a bit about when working with young people who use marijuana is the neuroscience behind both endogenous cannabinoids and exogenous cannabinoids. Um, how they work and how they exert their effects. Um, I found that a lot of young people are much more interested in hearing about this and taking it in. I think it um, comes across as less of a like scare tactic approach, which is what the whole risk discussion comes across as, and it's also hard for young people to really um, keep in mind the theoretical long-term risks of, of something that they are finding rewarding um, when they engage in. Um, but a lot of young people want to know how their mind and their body works, and a lot of marijuana users already know some things about the cannabinoid system. They like to talk about it and will want to share what they do know. Um, it's complicated, and what I put here is really oversimplified, and we're still just now learning a lot about how this system works. But in a nutshell, the endocannabinoid system which is um, a system that involves our cannabinoid receptors, which are all over the brain, other parts of the body too, but I'm gonna focus on the ones in the brain, and endogenous cannabinoids or ligands that we produce that are, um, are arachidonic uh, acid compounds. And um, the receptors are presynaptic receptors, and what they primarily um, do is they mediate the effects of environmental stimuli and they modulate um, homeostasis, emotional homeostasis primarily. So under stressful conditions, the body produces endocannabinoids, which then bind to presynaptic receptors and influence the um, degree to which other neurotransmitters are released. So the endocannabinoid system is involved in regulating mood, memories, particularly um, consolidation or focus on aversive memories, and is involved in both stress response and reward processing, especially social reward and met, um, motivation. The endocannabinoid system is still developing during adolescence, and this is why the um, risks of using during adolescence are different than the risks of uh, initiating use in, in adult years. THC, which is an exogenous cannabinoid, binds to the CB1 receptor as a strong agonist. Um, and when one takes in exogenous THC, frequently there's a negative feedback mechanism and uh, you get a down regulation of the CB1 receptor so that you go into a hypocannabinoid state when you're not actively high. And that, um, it, explains most of the symptoms that someone experiences when uh, in cannabis withdrawal, and those symptoms are really similar to uh, the symptoms of depression. People will experience anxiety, irritability, um, less interest in uh, engaging in social interaction. CBD, we don't understand quite as much about how it works yet, but it seems to be a negative allosteric modulator and that it kind of does, puts the brakes on THC a bit and um, can reduce the strength of the effects of THC and perhaps some of the down regulation that occurs when people repeatedly consume THC. And this is why the ratio of THC to CBD is so important. So I'm going to spend the remainder of the presentation talking about um, what we can do as child psychiatrists, psychologists, or pediatric mental health professionals when it comes to youth marijuana use. Um, you know, I think that pediatric mental health professionals should play a key role in preventing cannabis use disorder and treating cannabis use disorder. The primary reason is that 
patients who present for mental health treatment are at a much higher risk of developing a cannabis use disorder, childhood onset, ADHD, MDD, anxiety disorders, ODD, all put uh, a person at much higher risk of later development of a cannabis use disorder. In addition, the vast majority of youth with a substance use disorder have a psychiatric disorder, and most of them have, well, at least half of them have three or more disorders, so they are a complex patient um, population that are uh, likely in need of not just addiction treatment, but some sort of specialized mental health treatment, and we know that outcomes are better when addiction and psychiatric treatment is integrated. And the other really important reason is that it's really hard to get young people into specialty addiction care, especially specialty addiction child psychiatric care. While there's an extreme shortage of pediatric mental health services, there's an even greater shortage of uh, adolescent uh, addiction treatment services, and also patients and even parents are often resistant to the idea of being sent to an addiction treatment program. And what happens if, as physicians, we don't try to help our patients and their families better understand cannabis use disorders and how to go about um, treating and recovering from these disorders is that families turn to people who have very little to no professional training in the treatment of these disorders and who um, might recommend uh, approaches that are not at all based on the evidence and may actually be harmful and result in uh, worse outcomes to these patients and their families. Uh, just a quick note on how to figure out if your patient is using marijuana and if they are, how do you determine if they have a cannabis use disorder. There's screens, there's electronic screens, um, there's a lot of different uh, formal methods you can use, but really the easiest thing is to ask, and especially if you're taking a lot of time to meet with someone to do a thorough uh, initial evaluation, you would just slip it in there along with your other questions, ask if they use marijuana, have they ever used, and then you can go into more specific questions to get a sense of sort of the, the magnitude of the use, how old were they when they started using, and um, how often do they use, what type of um, marijuana products do they use, and there is data to uh, support the idea that self-report is almost as valid as urine drug testing, with the caveat being that in those studies, you know, that's a little bit of a different environment than when a patient is being dragged in by their parents to treatment. So in real practice, maybe self-report isn't quite as reliable. But um, if you ask, not just on the first appointment, but repeatedly as you get to know the patient, at some point, um, most patients will tell you at least a little bit about their substance use. You also, of course, want to get information from family members, collateral information, and then, of course, there's biological markers, urine drug testing. I think urine drug testing is really underutilized in all of psychiatric practice and, and pediatric settings. It's really very easy to do, even in a solo private practice. You just need a bathroom and a CLIA certificate, which is easy to get. And I think a lot of people are hesitant to ask a patient to provide a urine sample, but I believe there's ways to bring it up and explain the reason for wanting the sample um, that won't uh, negatively affect the therapeutic alliance. It is really important though, right from the beginning, to let the patient and the parents know what you're gonna do with the information when you get it. And depending on what setting you're working in, there may be different legal obligations and, and uh, state or federal statutes that you need to consider. I can answer questions about that later. It's kind of complicated. Um, then once you've determined that there is some history of use, there are um, signs or symptoms that you can look for that might suggest a use disorder in addition, of course, to using the DSM. Um, things like using at daytime, smoking around the clock, having coping motives uh, for use, having a lot of adverse childhood experiences, experiencing recent negative life events, or what in this uh, drug and alcohol dependence study they call lack of heart unburdening social support. And I was surprised but happy to see that they put that in there, which isn't exactly a scientific term, but it's certainly something I see a lot in my patients who use a lot of marijuana. They often are in a situation where they feel they have nobody, at least no adult, that they can really openly and honestly talk to and who they feel will not punish them and will like really like listen and try to validate their experience. <clears throat> 
Another barrier at times to providing treatment for cannabis use disorder and non-addiction specialty clinics is that a lot of people feel like um, treatment isn't effective or feel it's futile to ask about marijuana use. I've heard a lot of um, psychiatrists say things like, has anyone ever actually convinced someone to not use marijuana? And, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of, uh, non-evidence-based ideas or opinions or personal beliefs about um, working with these patients that sometimes get in the way of being able to help patients with uh, substance use disorders. But there is good and well-validated data that uh, treatments for cannabis use disorder are effective. They're effective in youth. They're just as effective in youth as um, what we see in adults. And what we see in adults is a we see about the same level of efficacy that we see for the treatment of any chronic condition like hypertension or diabetes. So the Cannabis Youth Treatment Study, which is the largest study to date to look at a variety of different treatments for adolescent cannabis use, found that about a quarter to a half of patients went into recovery during the study and follow-up period. A recent Cochrane review concluded that psychosocial intervention reduced the frequency of cannabis use and severity of cannabis use disorder. We also know that longer, more intensive treatment is usually more effective. And like with most studies, um, and these clinical trials, the intervention period is usually just a couple months, two to three months. So if we were able to actually study longer treatments, we'd probably see even better outcomes. And what I found in my own practice is that it usually takes at least two or three months of regular, like weekly or more sessions before someone starts really feeling motivated to change. And then at that point, people will start trying to change um, much more often than not and will usually be effective in doing so. So here I'm gonna briefly go over the evidence-based treatment approaches. These are approaches that you could use in a general practice, but probably not um, everyone is gonna be familiar with all these approaches. And I'm gonna shift after this to talking about just some general therapeutic principles that any therapist or psychiatrist or physician could use without getting additional specialty training to help your patients um, receive, receive treatment for their cannabis use. Um, but the evidence-based treatment modalities, just so you know, are cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, contingency management, which is essentially positive reinforcement, um, ACRO, which is adolescent community reinforcement approach, and then a variety of family therapies. And in the cannabis youth treatment study, they compared these therapies and also combinations of these therapies to each other, found that they were all about equally effective, and then there have been um, follow-up studies that found that a combination of two or more of these modalities was more effective than any single approach. There's also some data to support um, peer groups, recovery groups, things like AA, um, and youth specifically. There's not a huge role for medication, at least at this point in time in the treatment of cannabis use disorder. You've, most of you have probably heard about the um, study by Kevin Gray looking at N-acetylcysteine in adolescents who use marijuana um, and comparing it to placebo and all uh, teenagers received counseling. That study did find that teens put on N-acetylcysteine had twice the odds of uh, stopping marijuana, but when they did that study in adults, they found no difference from placebo, so we're you know, not exactly sure why this is. There might be something about N-acetylcysteine being more effective in young people or early onset users, but at any rate, I've never really been able to get any young people I see to take N-acetylcysteine in the way that you're supposed to take it, which is um, usually involves taking two pills in the morning and two pills at night, and a lot of um, marijuana users don't like the idea of taking pills at all, so I haven't um, really been able to use utilize that approach. There's a little bit of evidence that Topamax or Gabapentin might be effective in both adults and, and in youth, but there's greater um, risks and greater reports of adverse events, so I don't use that often, and, and most people don't unless there was a comorbidity that might um, warrant use of one of those medications. There is a oral cannabinoid compound uh, spray, which has THC and CBD, called nabiximals. And um, that does have evidence of being effective in adults for um, helping people stop and uh, marijuana use and not relapse to marijuana use, but it's not currently available in the US, it's available in Europe. Um, and then 
what I put here on the bottom, this is a little more theoretical at this point, but um, <clears throat> I think we'll see in coming years a uh, greater number of sort of lifestyle or complementary modalities that um, can enhance endogenous cannabinoid si signaling, and those may be effective in helping people cut back on their exogenous cannabinoid consumption, and there are some studies looking at exercise in young people who use marijuana and showing better results in the exercise groups. I want to mention, though, that as a child psychiatrist, most of the patients you see, if they're high school students, or often also if they're college students, they're probably not coming in, you know, totally of their own volition. Um, it's probably not their idea to make an appointment. A lot of times parents or other concerned family members are bringing them in, or they're coming in for a reason other than substance use, like depression or anxiety. Um, and there is some data that for non-treatment seeking people, which is probably most young people who, who you'll be interacting with, that motivational interviews interviewing and family therapy are more effective than other therapies. There's also a lot of um, <clears throat> discussion about the common mechanisms of change for all of these different therapeutic approaches. And this isn't just in the addiction field, although there's writing about it in the addiction research, but just in the treatment of psychiatric disorders in general. And there are probably a number of different common um, mechanisms to all these different specific therapies. And you probably don't need to know all the protocols and be familiar with the manual manuals for how to do the more specific treatments that I mentioned in the last slide. So that's what I'm gonna spend the remainder of the presentation on today, which is going over some common principles that you don't need a lot of um, extra training in that you can utilize when working with adolescent marijuana users that are likely to be helpful um, in the treatment of the marijuana use disorder and the comorbidities. And these are mostly gonna be MI and family therapy approaches, but I'll go into a little more detail. So I just sort of broke it down into five principles. Um, all of these are supported by the evidence base, although there is a fairly small evidence base, um, a small number of clinical trials uh, in youth specifically. So I've uh, also added some information uh, that comes from expert consensus or my own clinical experience. So I'll go through each of these principles in a little more detail. The first one is the recognizing the importance of patient-therapist alliance. There is uh, a lot of data in the addiction literature and in just the general uh, psychiatric treatment literature, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, that alliance is one of the most consistent and uh, strongest predictors of outcome. And so that's what we see in addiction treatment as well. And from that cannabis youth treatment study, um, there uh, was a paper that looked at the patient's uh, patient rated alliance and found that patient rated alliance predicted reduction in cannabis use and uh, reduction in cannabis use related problems. And this just kind of makes sense if you think about it, if you feel you have someone um, who is helping you, a strong helping relationship, you're gonna be more likely to stay in treatment, to feel safe and secure to explore your problems openly. You'll probably feel less distressed and you'll better be able to um, cut back your use or maintain abstinence. It can sometimes be hard though to build alliance um, with adolescents in general, but especially with adolescents who are using marijuana and who may not be wanting to really talk about or think about the negative um, effects of their marijuana use. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there often can be um, personal beliefs or personal experiences that can impair one's ability to build an alliance with this patient population. So, you know, the thing that I think is most helpful, and this is supported by the literature, when trying to build an alliance with uh, any patient, but particularly someone who uses substances, is to really try to focus on empathy and to be aware that empathy is a real desire and genuine curiosity to try to understand the experience of another person, to believe their subjective experience, um, to validate it, and to try not to overly identify or interject your own ideas or beliefs about what might be going on. Um, 
There's a really um, interesting study from the 80s that looked at outcomes of adults who were in treatment for alcohol use disorder. And in this study, uh, the therapists of these patients were rated using this empathy scale, and the therapists were grouped into highly empathic, medium empathic, um, or low um, empathic uh, therapists. Um, and what they found here, the first finding was not that interesting. The very empathetic therapists had, their patients had the best outcomes. But what was interesting is that the therapists who conveyed low levels of empathy during their interactions with their patients, their patients actually did worse than even weightless controls. So this brings up another important point about the harm that comes when you have a, when you're not able to really empathize at all with your patient. And a lot of patients um, who come see psychiatrists, especially patients who um, are using substances, they already are probably having a really negative experience of themselves in the world. They may be stigmatized, feeling um, like nobody feels that there's any good in them, and then it's hard to go on to feel like um, you might actually be good and you might be uh, capable of changing. Um, so it's just so important to kind of think through a humanistic lens and try to really believe that your patient is good, that they're not um, using drugs because they want to upset people and they're you know just being defiant, but they probably are experiencing something problematic and this is the best way they know right now to deal with this and they would actually like to um, self-actualize more and not have so many problems in their life. The other really important part of developing a strong alliance is to create a environment where people feel, uh, where patients feel there's a lot of trust. And again, this can be hard to do with adolescents. A really important thing to do that can be hard to do when you're the doctor or the therapist is to try to really take your time and not rush the process along. I'm gonna see if I can do this video clip thing correctly because I think Jane Goodall says it better than me. How do, how do we as human beings make others trust us and how do we trust other, other, other humans? Well, I think the important thing for me was uh, not to push too fast. I wore the same colored clothes every day so there was nothing new. Um, and patience. Patience. When you study animals, you simply must have patience. Justin, you wear the same outfit every single day. But um, it is really, you know, this just sort of uh, beautifully illustrates how important it is to be predictable, consistent, and most importantly, to take your time. And it's so hard, because um, as patient, you know, as, as uh, doctors or therapists, as someone in the healthy professions, you want people to feel better, you want to feel like you're effective in um, treating your patients, and then you also have parents who are understandably very concerned. But um, it's just really important to remember that if you push too hard too soon, um, you might actually create uh, worse outcomes than if you um, try to take your time and, and really believe that um, long-term results are much more important than short-term results. Okay, the second principle I wanna talk a little bit about is how to enhance a teen's motivation. Um, motivation should come from the patient, and there's good evidence to support that adolescents who are coming to treatment um, and have intrinsic motivation to be there have better outcomes than adolescents who come for extrinsic, re uh, extrinsically motivated reasons, um, which would often be like uh, the fear of consequences or punishment if they don't come to treatment. And it's I think actually not too hard to find um, a, pa a motivation in just about every patient um, who comes to treatment even if they are really um, not wanting to be there. What I usually do is I just try to ask the patient um, for a treatment goal and I usually uh, start my interactions with adolescents with the parents uh, and the teen in the room and I'll initially explain confidentiality in detail. Um, and then I will tell the patient what their parent has told me and why it seems their parent made the appointment and I'll ask the patient if they, um, if that's what they understand about why they're there and then they'll answer that question and then I'll say something along the lines of what I really would like to start with is to hear a little bit more about what 
you think might be helpful, uh, what you might want to focus on today, and what, if anything, you think I might be able to help you with during the time that we're um, spending together today. And I don't think I've ever had someone not say something. It's not going to be about marijuana use. It rarely will it be about marijuana use, but it will be something. And that's sort of like a way to um, engage the um, patient and get the patient to feel that there is something for them there in the treatment with you and to likely want to come back and talk again. But you really have to be comfortable and okay with the idea that their goal is probably not going to have anything to do with marijuana, at least not at first and probably not for a while. And you also have to feel comfortable with um, letting the patient talk a lot about what they like about marijuana and not trying to interject all the things you know, all the studies you've read about you know, what might not be so true in these big population studies about what the patient finds to be true. And by letting the patient talk freely about what they like about marijuana, you're going to develop and the patient's going to develop a deeper awareness and better understanding of what the underlying problem is. It's probably going to be something like social anxiety or depression or trauma. And you can focus on that initially, and most patients will at some point find a connection between the marijuana use and whatever the problem um, that they're most concerned about is. And this uh, slide here is just to, again, reinforce the idea that it's not helpful to try to ask a patient to change or to tell a patient how to change before they're ready to do so. You really need to spend a lot of time initially getting a patient from a pre-contemplative state to a contemplation, preparation, and then action state. You have to get patients feeling like they truly want to change for themselves, that they have reasons to change. And then at that point, you can offer um, more directive guidance, but still working in a collaborative approach with the patient to try to figure out how to change. And you know, at this point, the thing that the patient is wanting to change may not be marijuana, and that's actually okay. Um, because, again, it's rare that I see patients not change their marijuana use um, alongside this process, even when they are not directly talking about wanting to make changes in marijuana at this phase. And part of this has to do with understanding how a teenager's brain works and develops. Uh, for adolescents, the reward pathway is fully developed before the executive functioning pathway. So teenagers, for important evolutionary reasons, probably are more focused on novel and rewarding experiences than they are focused on all the possible long-term problems that can come from engaging with those experiences. So when a patient is um, talking about how they, say, are socially anxious and wish they had more friends or more social connections and are telling you that they smoke marijuana a lot because they're home alone on a Friday or Saturday night and it, it helps them feel less bored or less um, bad about being alone. You don't want to, again, push too hard too soon and try to talk about marijuana use right then and there. You want to really explore the experience that they're talking about and say something like, it, it sounds like it's been really hard to be so alone. It sounds like you really wish you had some deeper connections or you know more of a friend group. Um, and I can see why it's, um, why you want to find a way to feel better when you're feeling bad in that way. And I can see why you're using marijuana and you're finding it hard to cut back. And then just kind of leave it at that. And usually the patient will pick up and at some point bring the marijuana use up. Um, and I'm not saying you never weave in information about um, marijuana, you do, but you want to kind of weave it in more through the lens of how marijuana affects the brain than um, something that feels like a, a fear or scare tactic. Uh, so the third principle here is about providing individualized treatment and the importance of integrating mental health treatment alongside addiction treatment. The old thinking was that you treated the addiction first so that a patient could kind of think clearly and um, engage in mental health treatment. We now know that that's not necessary and the best outcomes are when you're delivering treatment for both disorders, ideally at the same time in the same setting. Um, it's important to recognize that there is no one-size-fits-all approach in a lot of treatment, especially early on. It's a process of figuring out what's going to work for that particular patient. 
And um, adolescents like this sort of care. You know, a lot of the adolescent years are about identity formation, and so they are really going to appreciate you seeing them as an individual and not trying to, um, you know, just fit them into a category. And this is why programs that have very uh, rigid one-size-fits-all approaches are not going to be effective for a lot of patients. So requiring something like AA for every single patient that has a substance use disorder is not the best approach. It may be helpful for some patients, but it may alienate other patients. The uh, fourth principle I want to talk about just briefly is about the importance of having meaningful and realistic outcomes for yourself and for the patient. Um, it's important for the patient to feel that they are making progress. If the outcomes are like so far-fetched and you're going to take so long to achieve, it's easy to get defeated and also to feel defeated as a therapist. Um, a really important goal is treatment engagement and retention. A lot of substance use disorder treatment studies have retention as a primary outcome or the only outcome because we know that when people stay in treatment, the longer they're in treatment, the more likely they are to get better and do better than patients who drop out of treatment. And that, you know, just kind of makes sense. Um, you also need to really think about, are you asking, you know, is the patient getting better even if they're not doing as well as you would like them to be or as well as their parents want them um, to be doing? There can be a lot of tension between what a parent thinks is realistic and what is actually um, a realistic goal at any point in treatment. So you want to just kind of step back and not get too concerned about the actual amount of use and how quickly a patient is changing and just look at the general trajectory. If things are worsening, then you need to step back and reevaluate the treatment approach. And you know, it's also important to know that many teens won't achieve total abstinence, especially with marijuana, and that's okay. A lot of patients can cut back and experience benefits of treatment without stopping entirely. Um, a fourth and very important principle, um, you know, just after the importance of alliance, is the idea that you should work with parents. A lot of times with adolescents, people are hesitant to see parents, especially if you're doing individual therapy with the adolescent. Um, but that's not the approach that I use or that is um, endorsed in, by any of the addiction uh, research or um, clinical experience of addiction experts. There is very good data that treatment that includes parents results in better outcomes, but unfortunately, treatment that truly incorporates parental guidance or really more like parental therapy is um, not widely available. It's more complicated and timely to include parents, but um, it's actually quite possible and I think perhaps even beneficial for the therapist who's treating the teen to sometimes be also the therapist that works with the parents and that goes against what a lot of people might um, initially think, but it sort of creates an environment where we model the open communication and listening and understanding and um, compromise can be a, an effective way to kind of get through life and to improve relationships and to actually feel better. With parents, you can't just give advice if you, you know, it's that easy, all the parenting books that we wouldn't have so many parenting books out there and you wouldn't need to be, I wouldn't need to have this slide on here. A lot of parents kind of know, or some parents kind of know in general what the more effective type of interaction with their child is in regard to helping them um, cut back on their substance use, but it can be hard to actually use that. Um, advice in the moment, so you need to use similar approaches with parents, using a lot of empathy and motivational interviewing approaches to try to really get parents on board um, so that the patient is having a different experience with adults, not just in treatment, but with their parents. Um, I know we're getting short on time, so I'm just going to say that there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of good resources out there to help um, you learn more about what sort of approaches um, when it comes to parenting are likely to be helpful in working with adolescent marijuana users. In general, it kind of comes down to a lot of what uh, you might do in DBT, like uh, validating, helping parents feel like it's okay to listen to their child's uh, subjective experience and that that doesn't necessarily increase the behaviors that a teen may engage in when feeling a certain way, it probably decreases it. 
um, and that it can be important to fix relationships before parents try to have more rules. Rules are more likely followed when the parent and the child have a strong relationship. I actually use the National Education Alliance BPD website um, a lot when working with families, not because all of the patients have borderline personality disorder, but there's some really good videos and other trainings that give parents an idea of what you can do in the real world with your kids. And then, you know, this is just a list of things that tend not to work. Um, tough love, dare, um, short-term, high-intensity, expensive 30-day rehabs. Most of this is a waste of time and money, and people need to realize that parents should be educated that treatment is often ongoing and um, long-term, and you need to pace yourself. I have um, one little video clip. I think I'll end with this slide and then leave a few minutes for questions. This uh, video clip is not specifically about addiction. This is Peter Fonagy talking about um, the what he believes is uh, fundamental to being able to help most patients, especially patients who may be hard to reach or resistant to treatment. Some of you might be familiar, all of you might be familiar with Peter Fonagy. He does a lot of research and writing on attachment and mentalization-based treatment. He's not an addiction specialist, um, but there is um, emerging research that mentalization-based approaches um, can be helpful in the treatment of hard-to-reach youth or uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, and uh, that there's a lot of overlap between personality disorders and, and substance use disorders, especially in youth. Our epistemic superhighway, our knowledge superhighway, is open when we feel that someone is interested in us as a person. Unfortunately, what can happen is that through trauma, through a, a loss of faith in this interpersonal process, that epistemic superhighway can be blocked off. No matter what people tell them, by way of reassurance. No matter what people tell them about their situation not being so bad, that they should really recognize this and that aspect of their life being much better than they think it is. They're unable to hear that. They're unable to actually make that information relevant to them. And they don't learn, they don't change, and then we blame them for being hard to reach. But they have lost trust in us. They have lost trust in us being honest communicators of information that is relevant to them. And the reason I like that clip and think it's relevant is it highlights um, a lot of the reason behind why um, approaches that focus on trying to educate or convince or um, teach skills to um, hard to reach patients, which is what, uh, you know, a category that I, that I think um, many adolescent marijuana users who aren't seeking treatment would fall into. Um, the reason that's not effective is that first we have to get patients to feel that we see them, that we um, get them, and that we have um, a way of being able to work with them and help them in the ways that they want to be helped. And that if you can focus, not get too hung up on all the different, you know, CBT, ACRA, all of that, and all the different rules and uh, worries about how to do this sort of work, and you just focus on creating an environment that is full of um, empathetic communication, that feels safe and secure, and um, where a person feels understood, you can do a lot to help adolescent marijuana users better reflect on their use, be curious about the ways in which their use may be affecting them, not just for good, but possibly for bad as well, and maybe contributing to some of the difficulties in their life. And once you help someone be able to think in that way, and more importantly, to be able to talk to someone else, to talk to you openly, to communicate those ideas, it doesn't take much to then be able to help people want to change, feel that they can change, and actually be able to go on and change.
Um, so I hope I helped all of you feel like you uh, feel more capable and interested in going out there if you're not already and working with um, adolescents and young adults who use a lot of marijuana and don't want to be in your office the very first time they come in. Thanks for having me.